everyone, and welcome to the ninth session of Typographics 2021, the festival for people who use type. I'm Barbara Glauber, Cooper Union faculty member, typographics conference advisor, and type user. The extraordinary team at Cooper Union has produced this festival for seven years, and this time we've been taking advantage of our collective familiarity with Zoom and taking the conference around the world with 11 guest curators sharing design perspectives perspectives in 10 sessions over a span of five weeks. Please check our website, 2021.typographics.com for the schedule and more information. Today's event is curated by Simon Charway, who has invited three amazing designers from Africa to share their work with us. But first, we'd like to show you some special typographic animations made by our sponsors specifically for this year's conference. I'm delighted to introduce today's curator, Simon Charway. Simon is a brand identity designer and anthologist on indigenous African design systems and African symbology. His work underpins a keener study of the visual culture of his home country of Ghana and of Africa. As a go-to expert on creating unique logos and symbols inspired by indigenous design systems, Simon has embarked on two book projects, the Museum of Adrinka and African Logo Design. Simon's research also focuses on working with Black creatives and creatives of African descent on the African Design Matters Free Directory Initiative. He has served as a jury member for the Graphic Design Awards Ghana. He is the Secretary of Design Ghana and a member of the Pan-African Design Institute, PADI, which is the Design Council of Africa, among others. I'll turn it over to you now, Simon. Thank you so much, Barbara. I'm super excited to be here too, and I, I'm really excited seeing the number of participants turning in. 
Um, before I begin, I would like to start with an introduction that to say that so that I should like to let us be on the same page. One of the challenges I've faced, I've seen over the years or past few decades is that I've seen that design has a cultural, uh, cultural uh, a heterogeneous cultural history, but a homogeneous cultural history. Let me repeat that again. Design has a heterogeneous cultural past, but a homogeneous cultural history. And what the, the challenge this poses is that on the Pan-African Design Institute platform, most one of the key discussions that they, they have over there has to do with how do we foster creativity across a discipline. And one of the answers will be that how we, the intersection between design, how we see the intersection between design and then culture. Today, I would like to introduce us to three uh, African uh, creative, culturally intelligent creative from Africa, who will be speaking with us today. And I would like us to have our first speaker will be Fongi Dube. Fongi is a strategic, intentional, and calculated brand and visual identity graphic designer based in Harare, Zimbabwe. She is a, deli a delicate balance. She has a delicate balance of process and creativity. Years of apl applied experimentation and research have nature the ability for her to think divergently and process creative solutions in a fluid and dynamic way. You could see that in almost a lot of her works on Instagram and other plat social platforms. Her work is heavily influenced by the delicate yet profound nuances that are embedded into African cultures, like natural elements and features, patterns and color, as a form of visual communication which propel her passion for elevating the African narrative through modernity, modern identity systems. I have personally known uh, Fungi in many ways and, and we've had a hard opportunity to chat with her as I usually do through the Design is a Cultural Response series. And one thing I've noticed about her is that you could see that each project she embarked on actually focuses on looking at her culture or looking at the project from the um, perspective of cultural response. Today she will be presenting on the topic threads writing and graphic systems embedded in African textiles. Then the, the description of this uh, topic, she, if I would like to elaborate slightly on it before I, she come on to talk more on it, is typically writing systems are a method of visual uh, representation, verbal communication, and are based on script and set of rules that regulate their use. However, writing systems differ and fundamentally have a, a reliable form of information storage and transfer. She will be talking to us much about this, but in the meantime, I would like us to have this understanding as the three speakers show their slides, that in Eurocentric kind of, in from time memorial, man has sought to saw information. And you could look at other cultures like the Eurocentric form, they use type, uh, a glyph or a, a, an alphabet to represent a sound and a combination of the sound to represent a word, and a combination of those words to represent an idea or an event to describe an event or to tell a story. Now, in, when you come to African, uh, uh, indigenous African uh, design systems or other cultures, the scenario is different. They also have what you call writing systems. But for example, if you look at adinkrasi or insibidi symbols, one symbol or uh, idea symbol actually stands for an idea or it actually tells a story. For example, if you see an uh, adinkra symbol like the Jinyami adinkra symbol, it's just a symbol, but it says a lot. It has a proverbial meaning and they have their symbolic meanings, aside their literal meanings. So today, permit me to welcome uh, Fungi Dube. Fungi, today, today is your stage and kindly come on stage. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, thank you so much to Typographics for having me here. I am super excited uh, because I get to share the platform with my African peers, but more so we get to take you on this journey where you can explore with us and learn a little bit more about Africa. So I'm going to hop over to my presentation now, and I hope that you guys sit back and you enjoy. So as Simon has already said, I'm going to be talking about threads. Um, 
And what's actually very intriguing about this is that I absolutely love uh, this quote here. So it talks about how African traditional textiles, right, other than being aesthetically pleasing, so I'm actually wearing one this evening, um, carry so much more messaging behind them. So they're used uh, in context of social and political commentary, for history, for social conduct, uh, religious beliefs, and much other things. So as we go on, you may be wondering, why am I talking about this? We're here for typography, right? But where's the type? And as Simon has rightfully put it, when we think of scripts, we always think of related symbols that come together to encode or to transfer meaning. But once we start looking in the African context, it looks very different. Um, and the reason for that is that we can have, you know, these phonetic alphabets, right, where you have, you know, letters or characters that come together to represent sounds of a language. So in my language, that will be A, E, I, O, U, or A, E, I, O, U, and will sound like Ba, Ba, Mai, you know, Moana. But there are other forms that these writing systems can take. So we think of them, especially in the context of being ideographic. So you get these abstract um, symbols that depict an entire idea, that convey an entire you know, message just as they stand alone. Or you can get them in pictorial form, right? Pictographics, where you have a symbol that actually depicts the object that it's representing. So this is very important for us to have this conversation because it opens up our minds to actually realize that more than just having these letters and characters, the other ways of being able to communicate. And these ways have actually shaped uh, global communication on a whole. So this is literally just going to be a visual journey um, through an aspect of African culture. And I say these are not my words because I stole this from uh, the back of uh, Prof. Sakima Fundiko's book. So hopefully he doesn't come for me for that. But I've been exploring, and this has been something that I've been very passionate about when it comes to really understanding more about Africa. I'm very big on pattern work. I'm very big on illustration. But once I started reading more and more on this, you realize that there's just so much that's packed into these textiles that we see every day. So I'm going to start off by uh, taking you through uh, the mud cloth of Mali. So Bogolan for short. And what's absolutely phenomenal about this is that when you look at the history and culturally, it's, um, you know, it's an entire writing system in itself. So we can see if we take it in a modern context where we may have to sketch, you know, where you have to maybe iterate on points, maybe you have to go into Illustrator, whatever the case is, to make sure that you form the anatomy of the type and everything like that. We do still see the same thing in the African context. So typically this is, has, and culturally, this has been done by women and they pass on their knowledge to their daughters who are then expected to carry this forward to future generations. And just looking at it, it looks almost as though it's just squiggly lines and, and triangles, you know, and dots, but they all come together to connect to form a bigger message. And I also appreciate how everything looks when it's worn together. It just feels so powerful, so strong, you know, like so African. And I really enjoy that about, you know, these graphic systems. So as we go even further, what we'll see is that they actually have meaning, right? So these motifs that are being uh, embedded into these textiles, you know, so delicately, right? And with years and years of practice, with fermented mud, more specifically in this case, actually mean something. So they may represent wealth and luxury. They may represent a farmer's sickle, so the agricultural disposition at the time. They may represent, uh, you know, things to do around festivities and just human rights and everything like that. And this is actually a representation of you know, a real life interaction with some of these fabrics so that you can get a deeper appreciation of it. Um, but they're absolutely stunning, 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 stunning. And when you actually realize more and more that it's not random and they're not, you know, just, uh, they are abstract, but there's so much meaning, it hits, you know, home a little bit harder as well. As we move on, we move on to Kente, and I'm sure uh, if there are any Africans in the in the audience, or maybe you may have seen it somewhere. It is very, very, very common. Uh, it's seen almost everywhere, and you know Kente is particularly very, very special. Sorry for that, because it's associated with royalty. So as I was putting this together, I was thinking to myself, 
what would kente be if we were to translate it into today's context right and maybe you know try it and structure it how a normal type is structured i feel it will be that regal very sophisticated elegant you know serif right uh because when you look at it and the history like i said it was something that was worn by by, by chiefs and kings and there's actually an amazing story behind it where uh, folklore says that apparently these two boys were in the forest and they, you know, met the spider who was spinning his web and he taught them all these amazing, you know, tricks behind weaving and then they took that back to the chief who took it to the king at the time and he absolutely fell in love with the concept and he was like, only the royal family should wear this. So when we actually go forward and we look at it, we see that it embodies that that sophistication, that elegance, right? When you see the Santeni just sitting over there, you know, he looks very strong, you know, very, very powerful, but he is also carrying a message. And what is even more intriguing about these textiles and more so kente is the fact that over time, no two kente uh, textiles or fabrics were the same. They all told a different story and they were all woven by hand on a loom, most, uh, more specifically by men. And the practice is culturally still meant to be carried out by men. Um, but you have all these different dyes, uh, sorry, all these different threads that come through and they all represent different things. So, you know, your gold representing your wealth and your luxury, and then you get the blues and the greens uh, representing uh, a, a sense of calm and peaceness and fertility. And you actually start to realize that everything is how it should be. It was very strategic. There was definitely communication that was coming through. And as we go on, um, as I have uh, mentioned, uh, you do find that specific kente fabrics are uh, represented an entire concept, right? So it could be social, political commentary. So things around autocrat autocratic rule, around independence, you know, it could be something that's internal. So, you know, striving for perfection or trying to achieve your wildest dreams. It could be something, you know, that was very intimate, like forgiveness, like love, tolerance. And again, um, because I do want for us to be able to, you know, gain a little bit more insight and maybe try and visualize these things in the real world. This again is another live interaction of what Kente looks like now. This uh, variation that I've just shown you is something that is now commercialized in the sense that it may be printed on Ankara, but in traditional and cultural terms, it was hand woven. The next one, and Simon touched on this, uh, is your adinkra, right? And I absolutely love the concept of this. Uh, and this is where we start talking about these ideographic, you know, types of alphabets, right? Where you have one symbol, an abstract symbol that conveys an entire idea. So I like to deem this as the talking fabric because then it's associated with proverbs and wisdom. And as we go on, what we tend to actually realize from this is that there are so many of them um, and they all represent, again, you know, states of being. They represent, you know, life's journey. They represent feminine qualities. They represent um, law and justice. And they are typographic systems within, within uh, their own right that tell you an entire message, which is essentially what we're striving for, to be able to encode and to transfer meaning. So if you look to the left-hand side, I, I, I think that this is, and pardon me, but I think this is probably one of the most badass pictures I've seen in a while. Uh, I appreciate how you see the Dinkra stamped on there and you just see how beautiful, uh, you know, everything is and how he just looks so strong in there. Right. And another important thing as well that we see is that we see how, you know, they are hand printed and hand stamped. So they all these stamps that are carved to perfection that convey this message as well. And as we go on, we see the craftsmanship. So as much as you would be using pen to paper, you see a local Ghanaian man here and he's using a comb to make sure that the lines are perfect and he's stamping everything by hand. 
And lastly, we move on to Kuba, which is one of my personal favorites. And this is the eco-friendly textile from the DRC. When I was conceptualizing this as well, I figured that Kuba in modern day definition, or if we were to fit it in this context, would be, you know, your bold, your strong, your geometric, like angular, you know, sans serif, right? The one that has authority. And what's actually amazing about it in my research is that I found out that, you know, all these amazing artists like Picasso actually had collections of this and they kept it for inspiration. And as we see, and we continue to move along in this journey, it is also exclusively made by females and then they're the ones also then pass on the knowledge to their daughters. So this is also another live interaction and representation of what that looks like in real life. Um, and I just really appreciate how everything is so ordered, but it also looks unrefined, if I can say at the same time, very organic, but the entire message is being told there. So this brings me to my point to say that when we look at African scripts, and more so as I've been talking about textiles and everything like that, we see that there's a major shift, right? There's a lot of commercialization of these textiles, but there's also globalization, right? Where people may not really understand the graphic systems behind them, but they actually have seen and interact with these textiles. And that for me means that there's so much impact in the messaging of these textiles. We see it everywhere now in homeware, we see it in social and political commentary. And that's something that we're not going to dive into today. We see it in celebrations, right? We see it in everyday life. And this is the impact that these graphic systems have on whether I'm here in Harare or someone's out there in the DRC, someone's in the UK, you may or may not have interacted with them at some point, but you, this is exactly the impact that they have. And now, because I've been speaking this entire time, and I've, as I have said, I have been exclusively illustrating some of these uh, components so that I can gain a better understanding of the systems myself. And hopefully, as time goes on, I'll be able to build a much bigger library. So this is just some African eye candy for you. I'm going to scroll through, and I hope that you enjoy the work. Good. That's a very powerful presentation. Thank you so much, Fangi. You've really done well. And I've had, we've had some few questions from our uh, participants, which I would like to address, we would like to address. But in the meantime, um, before our next presenter, we would like to do the, Q, let me do the Q&A session. We have a Q and five minutes for Q&A session, right? Okay, so the first question I have was, um, someone wants to know the, the bibliography and sources of these, some of these things you are showing there, they want to know. Um, presently, with regards to the design curriculum, as you know, and this question even ties to the second question I've seen on the, in the comment uh, session, which they ask, why is, why is this all this content, this beautiful content, not in African design schools? Yes, you, you realize that in my introduction, I mentioned that design has a, a heterogeneous cultural past, but a homogeneous cultural history. And this is due to the fact that we have a very Eurocentric kind of, uh, uh, or canonical kind of uh, design history and curriculum. And that is why we are having these conversations. So this conversation, as we say, is not, is to open up conversation, bring people together so that what we will begin. And like uh, if Barbara introduced I, there is this one book, I don't know if you can all see that, there is this book on Christian values in Adinkra symbols, which talks about um, basically the more context, like I said, you see one symbol, but you see the level of text, the num volume of text that is written for just one, one symbol. Also, I would like to quickly address um, your, um, when you were talking on the Cloth, I didn't crack cloth stamp. I have, let me quickly share my screen. Sorry. Okay. So, sorry. This, this cloth is actually uh, dated back as 1814. And there's two stories that ties to this, this type of, uh, this I didn't crack cloth, uh, stamp cloth uh, design. 
Uh, most people say that um, when the first uh, Santihini, that's Premier the, the first, were actually wore this type of cloth and, and even has some in his belongings whilst he was being uh, sent to exile by the British in search of. And But when I did some interviews with some custodians like Jack Nimo and uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Opon, what they told me was that this was actually uh, a cloth that dated as 1814, which was adopted by the first um, Thomas um, one sent, uh, minister sent to the Ashantis, was Thomas Edward Badwich. So you see that this is, is the tooth, and if you look, I've placed this uh, adinkra symbol close to it so that you can easily relate. You could see that the, all the adinkra symbol you've been seeing are all imprinted in these kind of symbols. But when you see and the difference between a kente cloth and an adikra cloth is that for us, Fungi just mentioned, the kente cloth is more of a royal feel. But because of commercialization, we see that in our daily fashion, we see people wear and even they print it with other kind of strips that we see in graduation in university, even foreign universities. So basically, there, there, there need to be some form of documentation. And that's basically what you are doing. In another example I'll give you is the book, my book, my manuscript, which shows um, symbols that we are creating, we are document we are working on for the Asantehini, new Adinkra symbols because of the, a lot of uh, proverbial knowledge system that is out there that we have to work on. I could also talk to our third speaker, that is Sebastian Garikai. He is also documenting, um, uh, create, uh, resurrecting funds that actually support African writing systems. So to answer the question again, it means that the, we have limited document or references to refer to what we have are more of oral education, which is usually the type of African kind of education. And then we also have some um, evidence. Fortunate for us, we have some evidence of these materials that we can actually reference to in the documentations we are forming. Fangi, would you like to add anything? Um, so I think just to add on to what you were saying, Simon, because this is obviously like, you know, something that is not new, but is new in the sense that not much is being said about it. So what I've actually found is also helpful is also looking up scholarly articles because there are other people like myself who are trying to, you know, explore and see what they can actually get from this. So I may do it in a visual representation, but they're taking time out to actually go out and do the research. And then they're coming up with these amazing papers where you can actually just, you know, gather a sense of what was going on during the time. So just to support what Simon has said, uh, if you are looking into resources that can help you with this, other than having maybe verbal conversations and maybe visiting these places and finding, you know, the elders within the communities to have a chat with, you can still look uh, up uh, papers that have been written by Africans uh, on this sort of thing. Thank you. Good. So um, let me quickly. So before our next presenter, I would like to share with you typographic animation made by our sponsors for this year's conference. Uh, right after that, we will have a uh, Torari, Valerie Matek present uh, right after that. And he wakes up and his arm is doing the thing uh, that's it's kind of glowing whenever he turns it on. So I think he finally like unlocked the hundred percent.
good now we, before i introduce my index our next presenter um i would like us to you see that these kind of conversation are then therefore very necessary so the questions are we always ask is how do we then um connect positively connect and to explore the various hypotheses around what design learning can then be if you see what uh, fungi has just presented wouldn't you want to have these kind of content in your design history books I think you would much want to know much more. And there are other African countries, there are other, uh, other cultures that has much narrative. We would like to always ask that, what does creativity mean to your culture? And I think that is the narrative of these presentations we are going to have. As uh, uh, Permit me to introduce our next presenter, that's uh, Torari Valerie Mateke. Uh, Mateke is a, a multi-award winner who is particularly interested in the potential of design in contemporary African visual culture, where traditional cultural practices often become a staged authenticity in which the history of meaning is objects in the objects and design is often lost, sometimes even to the producers themselves. It is in this way that important indigenous systems have been uh, transfigured in contemporary society merely as an element of decorative arts and here to for mass um, consumption she sees the potential of design to halt this waste and abandon our most valuable cultural resources owing to her underlying passion for africa in february 2018 she co-founded the inca creative agency which aims to fill the gap in the market of producing entertainment materials not only is this material innovative but it's also authentic and significant to Africans, their identity and cultural heritage. Tora has, Torari also owns a Tavetke's design, and she, which she started in 2011. She was most recently picked in the Laurel Youth Committee, representing Africa and the Middle East. She will also be speaking about the title for her topic uh, presentation today will be on indigenous knowledge of the Bantu symbol writing and how it may be revived in the African contemporary visual practice. That's a study, the main a study of the indigenous knowledge of the Bantu uh, symbol writing and how it may be revived in South Africa, contemporary visual practice, as well as pass on to the next generation. I will give room for Matik to herself to talk to us about some of these things. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone. I will not waste every, anyone's time, but go straight into my presentation. Okay, good evening, everyone. Depending on which part of the world you are, um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, my name is Taurai Valerie Mutake, and I am a creative designer from Zimbabwe Harare. I am the, as mentioned before, the co-founder of Naka Creative Agency and Tavitek Designs. I am also, um, <laughs> Let me skip the slide. Okay, I um, was recently selected to be part of the Lurie's Youth Committee, and I'm also a member of Pan African Design Institute, and I'm also a board of trustee um, for graphic designers Zimbabwe. Uh, it is my pleasure and honor to be a speaker at Typographics New York City. <laughs> Conference, I thank you. So getting straight into the reason why I am on this platform today, um, my question to you, um, my audience, the people looking at the screen at the moment, I would like to ask, do these uh, symbols on the screen look familiar to you? Do these also look familiar to you? And if the answer is no, 
I am here to explain this to you today. So I will start by talking about where this came from, where these symbols came from. Um, Bantu is a word that is um, that refers to people of many of languages in Sub-Sahara. By um, saying languages in Sub-Sahara, um, I also realized that during the compilation of this uh, presentation, I realized that some uh, some languages in Africa sound the same, and it is one of these. That's the reason why I'm talking about this now to say the African languages come literally from the same place, but because people moved or migrated from that same place, languages and sound of these, um, these languages started differing. So I will explain this um, a bit later in this presentation. So these are called Bantu symbol writings and each symbol represents not only a single character or a letter as explained by Simon Chawe in the beginning that we had, uh, we have symbols that are there that we normally used to use, but because of um, normalizing to using the Roman alphabet, um, most of us don't know about um, these symbols. And so this is the reason why we're talking about them today and trying to get them back to start using them again. So as I mentioned earlier, they don't represent only a single character or letter in that typography in a different world is seen as letters and characters, but in the African context in this uh, present uh, slide, it's, um, it represents a whole word or a complete idea. So these are also um, some of the other symbols that I uh, have been grabbed from my mentor's, um, my mentor's book, who is uh, Professor Saki Mafundikwa, who wrote the book African Alphabets. And it is particularly this, uh, this topic in his book that was much more closer to me. It was much more closer to home. And when I was doing my thesis project for my honors, I decided to pick and research more about Bantu symbol writings. So it is that it is also this quote by Marcus Garvey that says, a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is like a tree without roots. For me, to be honest, it felt like if I didn't know about these symbols, if I didn't explore, if I didn't um, know about these, uh, it meant that I'm almost like a tree without roots. So for me, it's this topic that made me start researching about the Bantu symbols and finding out what really happened, where they came from and the history and the origins of these. So I also wrote a research paper um, titled Reading Between the Lines African writings and their influence on contemporary visual communication. I've also written a book that's not published yet that's called Bantu Symbol Writing, Preserving Southern African Cultural Heritage. And I've also uh, come up with a concept for a board game, which basically I will again talk about later in this presentation, if time allows. So the overview of this um, research was Firstly, to trace uh, my roots, uh, origins, and expansion of our languages, visual symbolism. The second part of it was the present moment. What are we doing with the symbols that I have or we have researched, and what are we doing about them? Are we reviving our past for future generations and the future, expanding what we are talking about even today? It might inspire someone and they would like to. Um, give a, give it a go in terms of how best we can try to bring this back. So my research started with, okay, looking at why, what, when, how, uh, possible challenges in this and possible outcomes. And again, we will talk about it. It was mostly inspired by bringing back um, 
getting it back, the Sankofa, which you will, which has already been spoken about from the Adingrid symbol. So I won't get much into that. I also then um, managed to go to Ubaba Kredomu, the late Baba Kredomu was village um, where I managed to research about existing symbols as well and figure out where these are still existing and how best we can preserve these. And um, on the right is when I managed to, when I went to the village and was interviewing Baba Pedro Mutwa's um, grandson to say, okay, because he wasn't feeling well at this time, unfortunately I could not meet him and it was, uh, a very difficult time for the family, but they allowed me to at least visit the, uh, the, the village and get uh, an understanding of these symbols. I also got the privilege to meet Umama Esther Mishlangu, who really inspires me a lot. I managed to go to her village where there are these beautiful, amazing paintings of hers. And I'm sure most of the people watching right now know about these symbols. So as I was explaining, um, on the on this slide you would see the the middle picture at the top has symbols that show um, that has the paper that I had to show Umama Esther Mishlangu. Um, about the project to say, okay, I love her paintings. I've seen her drawings. I've seen her paintings. I've seen her work. And I would love to know if she, I love to know if she knew these symbols. And to my surprise, um, at least unfortunately, she didn't know these, but she had an idea of um, maybe where this may have come from. So I was researching deeper to see maybe how, lo how long ago have these symbols been lost. And it was quite interesting to also see the similarities in terms of how these symbols were put out there in terms of the methods of painting. So at the top right of the image, you see a skateboard that was being painted at that time using the original type of um, paintings. There was no paint like in the shops we buy now, but using um, actual soil with different types of um, colors. And also it was quite interesting how I was told that the monkey's tail, well, monkey's tail was one of the brushes that were used to do or paint these. And also that um, some of these uh, paintings even if it if it would rain, they would not wash away. So these the, it meant that the 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 colors in here would would sustain, or they would be there. They would not go away. So there was that too, and also the paint brushes they would use. You know, um, chicken feathers to paint. So these were like the paint brushes. So it was quite interesting to find out more about the, the colors, the methods of painting of how these symbols were done. So without wasting too much of time, because I'm left with a bit and have a lot to go through, um, what came to me when I was doing this project was that, okay, um, I'm trying to come up with 100% African project that is inspired by Africa and everything in it should be African. So from the packaging of the board game itself to how Africans used to carry the bags, it would be a quiver to go for hunting. And that's how I packaged the board game. And also, so this is just an overview of what the board game looks like and how or how the things that were packaged in it. So it's a mat. And then it's a book where you will see later on what it's all about. And the same in this picture as well. So I'll skip this part and this part. And also thinking about typography, how best um, to, 
to relate this to the existing um, alphabet, Roman alphabet, to say, okay, making at least a typeface that is inspired by Africa, inspired by the Bantu symbol. This is still work in, pro uh, in progress. And um, my friend Sebastian and I are working on a typeface that's um, to do with the Bantu symbol writing. So it's still work in progress, so I will not be able to show it as yet. And so this led me to the book I was talking about, the Bantu symbol writing, preserving Southern African cultural heritage. And this book is literally uh, my research on how the Bantu symbols came about and how best I thought a book, not only a book can preserve some of these symbols. So not only is it a book with symbols, but it also has a flashcard game in it, which can be plucked out um, to teach each other. It's like a dictionary in a sense um, that shows the symbols and you could play with them uh, just like any flashcard game, show the symbol and then in three languages, uh, in Debele, Shona and English to uh, also preserve the languages as well. So that's what it was about. And to stamp a story, um, once you finish playing the game, you're able to stamp the story uh, using the tokens that you would have won in the, in the game. So these were also posters that were um, being accompanied, uh, accompanied by um, the project. And also, like I said, the flashcard games, this is just a preview of what they would then look like if they are plucked out of the book. And also trying to go with the whole digital world. Um, symbols are something that one sees and may remember. And in this case, because the world is digitalizing, it is also good to keep these symbols in a digital space where you could play a game to remember what the meaning of a symbol is. So in my whole theme of the whole project, it's play, learn, and tell a story. So my whole target was kids, especially to preserve the system, to preserve the symbols. So what's also interesting is that I worked with um, Pule, who then um, was also an editor for my book. Um, and he also told me about the Isi Bekli Soshlambu, which is uh, mostly about Ditemata So Dinoko in Sesutu, which is basically a system for writing the words of Southern African yeah. languages, Sintu, that has a visual logic originating in um, traditional arts. Um, so basically, it's, it's a writing system that constitutes uh, pan Southern African photography, which can convey the languages of the region and more efficiently than the Roman alphabet. So to know more about these, please, um, I wish I'd uh, saved a, a link to go to the site where you can also um, see how you can write with this sort of writing system which is inspired by the Bantu symbols as well. Um, it works together um, in the sense of the color and it also pronounces. So in this case, um, yeah. okay, I'll leave you to it to explore on this side. I will go on to the next slide where I also am showing uh, Mam Gobozi designs a work, which is also inspired by um, the Bantu symbols, mm -hmm. the Bala, and then the African center. While with the African center, it's also inspired by many other African mm -hmm. symbols, um, African yeah. writing systems. And I, mm -hmm. I, I got the privilege to go and see the Africa center that's actually currently, well, just rebranded by Mam Kovozi. And it was quite interesting in terms of the, the process and the flow. So I would say again, um, it is something that I'm also encouraging and having learned from um, the TED talk that Professor Mafundiko said that Africans should start looking for inspiration from within. And I'm happy and glad to see that 
more projects are coming out inspired by the African indigenous um, system. Um, and so this is also one of my other designs that I have published to show how I am being inspired by African symbols to create um, upcoming or rebrand for rebrands for, for African um, brand identities. So also being inspired by the symbols themselves. So also looking again for inspiration from within. I will now um, share a video of what my entire presentation was about or what inspired me. Um, this is just to show how I what the idea is, and I'm still currently working on refining this project, Madimi, which uh, basically means um, conversation, let's tell a story, languages, sorry. Um, so this is where I'm at with the project, and I would love to share the video, mm -hmm. which basically shows how the board game, the book, and everything worked together. At this point, I would like to say thank you to everyone who has been watching and thank you to my family and friends for the support. Thank you so much. I hope you learned one or two things. Unfortunately, there's not enough time to explore everything and explain everything, but I hope um, someone picked something about the Bantu symbol writing. Thank you so much. Wow, that, that's, that's, that's really a lot. That's really a lot. In fact, I will be jumping right into the Q&A. My first question for you is, in fact, I, I the book, the copy, where can we get if the uh, participants would like to have a hand on their book? Where can they have a copy on Amazon? Unfortunately, it hasn't been published yet as I'm okay. still working on publishing it, but as soon as it's out there. I have a page on Facebook that's um, titled Bantu Symbol Writing, where I'm giving updates about the whereabouts and when um, we'll be able to publish this. Uh, please, can, can you, right, right after, before Sebastian come, you, can you share that link with us, the Facebook page, when we are all, yes, also. Um, my, my question to the uh, participant will be that, uh, do you see your culture? having a feel of this presentation ongoing, do you see your culture as a statement of creativity? And I'll leave that to us. Maybe you will drop your answers in the chat whilst we take some more few uh, animations uh, from our sponsors uh, made specifically for this year's uh, typographic events.
get a con in your inbox every single month. Font of the month. Good, that's, that's a wonderful one. Thank you all. At this stage, we are almost about wrapping up with our presentation. Our last speaker, I would like just to introduce to, I'll introduce you to our last speaker, that's Tapiwanashi Sebastian Garikai. Gary Kai is actually a brother, if I should say, I should put it that way, because we've been in constant conversations around the issues of design and then design as a cultural response. Sebastian Otapinwanashi is a graphic and type de uh, designer from Zimbabwe. As a creative, he strives to develop work that speaks to others about the beauty that exists in African culture and society reading new life into his work so that African ideas, innovation and lifestyle are visible. After observing the current digital typographic landscape, he noticed that few fonts support native African writing systems, and of the few that exist, some are not accessible to the general public. This motivated him to embark on a project to create fonts that support African writing systems. Today, he will be talking to us about the Sankofa, on the title, the Sankofa in the African Writing uh, System Journey. Sankofa can be defined as going back to the past and bringing forward that which is, is useful. Um, in our Ghanaian Akan tradition or saying, we say of proverb, Titiwobi Khan, Titiwobi Tre, which literally means, if the past has something to say, then it literally it actually have something to teach. So in this talk, uh, Sebastian will be like to share with us his journey of creating fonts for African writing system, demonstrating how that can um, enable us to connect the past with the present, allowing us to be culturally intelligent designers of the future. As I always say, the next evolution of designers are those who are learning from different cultures and creating from multiple perspectives. Now, permit me to uh, allow me to welcome uh, our brother, Tapiwanashi Sebastian Garikai. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Simon, for the introduction. And thank you so much for to Typographics for giving me this chance to present uh, my work and this uh, important stuff that I'm doing. So without wasting any time, let me share my screen and get straight into the presentation. Okay, as uh, just as uh, Simon, my good friend Simon has just mentioned, uh, my talk is uh, the Sankofa in the African writing system journey. And basically in this, I'm going to be talking about uh, my journey in the creation of writing systems. And just to, 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 to clarify uh, what Sankofa is, it is uh, in, in, in Andika symbol from, from Ghana that symbolizes the act of actually going back into the past and bringing back that which is useful. Not just anything, but 
only that that is useful. And uh, this has sort of guided me uh, in my creative journey, especially when I started exploring chat design. Um, initially, yeah, I was trying to create, you know, like uh, the usual uh, uh, Latin uh, script based fonts, but then after a revelation, uh, uh, after watching professors, one of Professor Sakima Fundipo's uh, TED Talks, I actually uh, had it. Uh, I actually started thinking about, I actually had, you know, a, a shift in, uh, in mindset about what I actually have to do. And uh, I started looking from within. And with looking from within, I started uh, on this project. Uh, the Ngwangwego script, which is uh, essentially a writing system that was created by Mr. Nolan's Ngwangwego from Malawi, which was created uh, with the intention of uh, decolonizing and removing the Latin alphabet from um, replacing the Latin alphabet rather with the Ngwangwego script, and also uh, to better represent uh, the the languages that are spoken by Malawians, since the Latin alphabet doesn't fully represent uh, the spoken languages of Malawi, and it only not uh, it not only uh, uh, transcribes Malawian languages, but also uh, Bantu languages that are used here in Southern Africa and even further up north in uh, other parts of Africa, and uh, with this. I started looking at uh, some of uh, the, the work that Mr. Nolan's one way we had done. And from this, you can see uh, an extract from, from the book that she wrote uh, using the one script, the, the one script. And this was all handwritten. And uh, on the right side there, you can see uh, the basic syllabic repertoire of, uh, of the writing system. The writing system is actually an alpha syllabary or a syllabary. And, yeah, and yeah, in this picture, you can see the, the picture of the book that he wrote, which is called uh, Amalawi Tilipati. And in those images, you can see uh, Mr. Nolan's Mwangwego actually teaching uh, a class uh, about the Mwangwego script. And there, there's another instructor who was actually instructed by Mr. Nolan's Mwangwego, and she's also teaching uh, the script to some students. The script uh, has been taught in, in, in some schools, but then uh, it hasn't been fully uh, accepted or fully adopted by, by the larger population, uh, largely due to the lack of support from, from, the, um, from the Malawian government. And then for, so initially what I did was that I, I started uh, with this project, which was uh, the Mwangwego Patents Project, whereby I was taking these uh, letters from the Mwangwego script and I was I, uh, incorporating uh, uh, African pattern designs in them, you know, and it was a way of trying to raise awareness to 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 to, to, to the larger community that uh, there's something that exists, you know, like there's something that exists uh, for them, for Africans, for us, and it was actually interesting because uh, I actually came across some uh, some Malawians actually started contacting me like via my social media channels uh, on Twitter and Instagram and. It's actually surprising that some of them didn't actually know that uh, such a writing system exists for for that was created specifically for for their language. So yeah, this is something that was really great. And then you can see in the mid, we actually created an, a poster for the International Mother Language Day. And uh, if you look at the symbol, it is inspired by uh, the mbira, the mbira musical instrument, which is a traditional instrument for the Shona people here in Zimbabwe. And uh, it's also widely used across Africa, even in Malawi as well. And moving on from that, I decided to create uh, a font supporting the Mwangwego script. And this is still very much uh, work in progress, but uh, I've done quite a lot of work on it. And uh, the aim of this is to actually have this working and hopefully, Support uh, Mr. Nolan's Mangwego in his in his uh, endeavors to to promote the script and uh, have people using it. And lucky enough, Mr. Mangwego is still alive, and I'm I'm in contact with him uh, here and there so that uh, for, for feedback. 
so here's the script and you can see they are uh, some some words the demonstration some words uh type setting and the next uh writing system that i'm going to talk about is uh the core alphabet which is one of the most popular uh native african writing systems most popular and most successful as well which was created by sulman kante in 1949 in guinea and this was created in response to an assumption that uh African languages cannot be transcribed. Uh, and, you know, Mr. Suleiman Kanti, in, in intellect, uh, decided to, 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 to do something about that and he created the core alphabet. Um, and it is, it, is, um, it is an alphabet and it is written from left to right. Uh, and it was created for, for the mining languages of West Africa. And it's now uh, widely used uh, in that region. And here you can see, so, uh, some extras from books that have been published using uh, the core script. And to date, so many publications have been done using this core script, including websites. There are so many websites that are that are available that are, that are uh, typeset in 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 the core script, and also a lot of books that have been published using the core script from mathematics, science, uh, uh, history, you name it, like a lot, like a lot, and even newspapers as well. And then yeah, I created uh, this font, a phonic core font, and uh, this was inspired by the squarish uh, block letters uh, that I found from old newspapers and some old publications that we created uh, that I used that use the core alphabet. And yeah, you can see some some of the features from the font. And then in a very interesting one, a uh, very interesting project that uh, I looked at was the Medefine script, uh, the Medefine al alphabet, uh, actually, which is uh, a spiritual uh, script that was created for spiritual purposes. And this is used by the Ibibio congregation in Nigeria. So it was created in the 1930s, in the 1930s, and it was created specifically for religious purposes uh and it's a very fascinating story because in the sort of the creation of how it came to be it was actually uh it was actually created uh after a vision that was seen by one of the members uh who saw a vision uh in the dream of god telling him of what the letters should uh look like so it's really something that's fascinating and um uh, for me it drew some particular interest because it's something that's really unique, something that you don't just find anywhere else. And uh, there you can see some some uh, uh, some of the characters, the characters of the alphabet, and also a letter that has been written used uh, written using the the Medefine uh, the Medefine uh, script. And what's particularly interesting is that uh, when this script was created in the 1930s. Uh, it was mainly used for liturgical purposes, but it was the, under the British colonial rule, they actually banned the use of this script. They actually banned the use of this script. So after two years or so, uh, the script started, uh, started facing uh, major disuse, and it was now only used in very small circles, just mainly for, for letters, uh, writing hymns, and you know stuff like that, uh, mainly stuff to do with religious purposes. And at the present, uh, at the present time, in the present time, um, very few people use it. Very few people use it. Even the members of the Oberio Kaime uh, uh, Christian sect that created this uh, alphabet, very few of them are actually able to read this or use it. And it's reported that about twenty or less than 20 of them are only fluent uh, in this in this uh, in this script and uh, at the moment there are some nigerian universities that are still that are now working uh, with their linguistic departments to actually revitalize these writing systems and there is uh, a font that i'm currently working on uh tsg modified in font and i hopefully hopefully if i'm when I finish it, I hopefully hope to contribute to the cause and actually help people and uh, help in the 
revitalization uh, process of the writing system. And another very interesting one is the Bamun, Bamun syllabi or the Shumum script, which was created by King Ibrahim Joya from 1896 to 1910, uh, which was created for his people from the Bamun kingdom in Cameroon for the Shumum language or the Bamun language. And uh, as you can see, this uh, when he started creating, when he first made it in 1896, it was actually a pictographic uh, writing system or a logographic writing system. And uh, over the years, just up to 1910, uh, he kept on uh, developing it and refining it uh, up to the modern version that exists in the present day. And again, uh, just like the others, just like uh, the fates that faced the writing system that we've created in this period, in this era of colonization. Uh, King Ibrahim Joya uh, created this writing system to actually write, uh, to better represent the language of his, uh, of his people and also to document uh, the histories of these people. And actually, he actually used to write uh, uh, histories and importantly, historical events that used to happen within, within the kingdom. Uh, he uh, published like, uh, and he also actually created a printing press where, where they published educational material on, on medicine, health, and uh, several different aspects. And uh, under the French colonial, he was then uh, exiled. He was then exiled. Uh, in, 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 he was then exiled, and then the script started facing again. Uh, Major disuse, a telephone to disuse uh, around the 1930s uh, because of that. And yeah, uh, it's actually famous because uh, the Bamun script actually evolved from a pictographic writing system uh, into a syllabic writing system. So here you can see uh, the early version of uh, the syllabic writing system, which was called, which was also known as the Bima. And Along the way, it came up to this uh, version that is currently in use, which is called, uh, which is known as the Akauku, the Akauku uh, syllabi, which is the one that is in use right, right now. And it's also known as the Mfemfe, Mfemfe, which means new. And at the present moment, uh, efforts are, are, going, uh, are ongoing at the Royal Palace to actually uh, revitalize the, the, the writing system and actually Put it into use, and here there's uh, this uh, a font that I created, TSD Bamun font, and it's in three ways. And here you can see the characters of the Bamun script. So this is the modern version uh, of the script, which is syllabic, and also the historical one, the logographic version, can also be created. Uh, it can also be used mainly for 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 educational purposes. And on top of that, um, I'm also creating uh, a font that, is, that I hope will support uh, a number of African writing systems called Nyora. And Nyora is essentially a Shona word, which means uh, to write, to write. So I'm actually trying to tackle that uh, or assumption that Africans still didn't know how to write and, you know, like putting it in, into action. And this is my response, Nyora, Nyora font. And at the moment, I've worked on Koom, Pamun, and Basava writing systems. And that's what it currently supports. So thank you so much. Uh, I think from, 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 from this, uh, it's not only uh, it's not only an act of getting back uh, what is this from the past in terms of uh, the symbols, but also the ideas and the reasons of about why they created these writing systems in the first place. So this is my act of uh, taking back from the past and putting it in, in, in the modern mode, and hopefully. Uh, Again, inspire future generations to to, be, to become uh, culturally uh, intelligent individuals who know uh, where they came from and what lies in the future for them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sebastian.
this is this is massive massive information and thanks so much um well, we'll have about almost about i think two two or three questions for you before we wrap up and what will be i will i will i've seen that in your intro and then the last slide you have we have, you have a specific font that it looks a little bit inspired by some some form of a uh, it shares some prototypical element of some african symbol i don't know if you could share light more light on that and also um if you could help us at the various uh, each of the writing systems you have uh, worked on you mentioned the type of what the slab that you have used if you could clarify the different type of uh, writing system that are then um how you seek also the third question would be how you seek also to uh, document these all these that you are doing is there a book are you converted into a kind of book how are we going to see these in classrooms african schools and even how is this going to even influence design history okay so uh, I'll, I'll start with in Tapa with the font question the initial okay. so the font that i use is called in Tapa. although it's latin based uh it's actually uh, a Sankofa project in the terms that uh, I was taking back from the past and putting it into the present, taking back, taking back what is useful. So the, uh, the phone is called Mtapa, which is named after Mwene Mtapa, uh, was uh, the king of the Mtapa kingdom here in, in ancient Zimbabwe, actually. Uh, and uh, the forms of the letters uh, are actually inspired by, by the patterns, which we call the chevron patterns and the architecture of the great Zimbabwe uh, uh, ruins which are found here in Zimbabwe, which are also part of that uh, period where, where, where the Mtapa ruled. And yeah, so that's basically where the inspiration came from. And then uh, in terms of uh, documenting, I'm actually in the process of creating uh, a book and this one is going to take uh, a different a different path actually if I, if I may say uh it's not going to focus on uh the historical issues and stuff like that because i think professor sakima fundiko's book african alphabets uh deals deals with that so in this book i'm going to be actually talking about how one can actually go on to create uh several different African writing systems. Because the goal is to have more people uh, actually uh, getting into this uh, movement of creating more uh, African fonts. Yeah, exactly. Because we can't have the current situation whereby it's only a few people who are actually doing it. So we actually want people to create, create and create more. Yeah. So the book will be mainly focused on that. Oh, okay. My, my my last question will be uh, the way are you uh, your approach of even your presentation. Do you have any interest of actually teaching in a university, or actually having your own course whereby people can actually learn from these some of these things that valuable lessons you are showing to us? All? Yes, sure. Uh, I'm very much open to it in terms of. Uh, teaching at universities or even giving guest lectures because you know it's the act of decolonizing uh design education uh okay. not just decolonizing uh, design but then decolonizing design education because that's the basis that's where it all starts from you know it's too late to decolonize design mm -hmm. but then if you start from the basis yeah if you start from from the basis from where the person is going to start uh you know the feeding the feeding process I think that's where the crucial uh, the crucial step okay. is. Yeah, thanks, from thanks the so educators much. themselves. Yeah, through that. Thanks so much, Sebastian. I, I really appreciate your time and all the three presenters. You really did well. In fact, you have really represented Africa. And you could clearly see that cultures indeed exist to honor the magnitude of creativity and civilization. And as we've been showing on the African Design Matters platform, that design is a cultural, indeed a cultural response. And for um, time memorial, we can see that many cultures have actually uh, influenced uh, the, uh, the visible and invisible part of their culture have influenced design we see today. And also, my, my question or my contribution to this uh, conversation is that 
um, I'm much more interested in what happens after these kind of conversations, these kind of con open conversations we are having. For example, I see typograph uh, uh, what, sorry, typographic events to be an other event, similar event to be some a platform that actually help us to have uh, diverse ideas about what uh, creativity or design learning can actually be and not what it must be. And therefore, I look forward to uh, uh, an era whereby, from looking from now onwards, moving forward, we will see the engagement of these kind of organizations, IGA and the rest, Cumulus and Paddy, and then Typographic coming together to actually collaborate, to actually see how best we can actually decolonize design educators. Actually, I always say that it's not decolonizing design education, but it's decolonizing design educators, because what's the use if we have the these kind of conversations and the design educators are not actually uh, putting it to use. For example, if uh, you are a typographic design uh, uh, educator in a classroom, if you ask your student to design a typeface, um, basically they will end up going to rely on the Eurocentric kind of idea by going to Baskerville, Hervetica and the rest. But if you could change the question by saying how design a typeface that honors your culture, then I see that the design educator actually playing a role in this regard. So that, that's very important as we, we have this conversation, we must actually start doing the works and that's the most important aspect of this kind of uh, activities that we are having. Now I would like to, us to, I would like to introduce us to um, Barbara who will take over from me over here. And it's been a long day and in fact, I'm really excited that we, we had this kind of conversation. Thank you so much and thank you all. And we'll do our best to um, start sharing some of these, uh, the questions that they, they've answered, they've asked. We'll do our best to sh uh, share it as a response in our Instagram carousels to see how best we can address some of these issues. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Uh, th this was just a fantastic session. Thank you so much, Simon, and to our wonderful speakers for this awesome, vital, and inspiring session. I was taking screen grabs, making notes, and opening tabs. Um, and, and also, there was so much love and appreciation for Saki Mufandikwa in the chat. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't seen his talks, he's, he's uh, very important and revered, clearly. So um, thank you again. This was just amazing. Um, please join us Thursday for the last stop on our world tour, curated by Anuthan Song. Wong Sakakun and featuring, featuring speakers from Southeast Asia. Check our website for the schedule um, and good night and good day. Thank you. <laughs>